So I'll give just another minute for people to um, come on and then we'll do 10 minutes of meditation. And I'm going to suggest tonight that um, people use the technique of RAIN to do this meditation. And who is familiar with RAIN? Who has done RAIN meditation? Okay, a couple of, couple of people. Oh, I'll explain it, but it's a very, I, I think especially as tonight we talk about the parami of wisdom, that RAIN is an especially um, helpful approach to meditation. And R-A-I-N, it's an acronym, was initially developed by Michelle McDonald, uh, I think in the 90s. And more recently, Tara Brock has done a slight revision to it. And Tara says that that's what she teaches primarily. And that seems to be what has the best kind of response. So in RAIN, the first part is just to R, recognize. Just recognize what's going on, like anxiety, bracing mind, uh, sluggishness. So you're just trying to, to recognize um, where the mind is in just a very open, non-judgmental way. You know, where is, where is the mind right now? Um, or it can be, you know, where's the body right now? Is the body really um, tense? So it's just sort of checking in to see what's predominant and recognizing it, naming it, what's going on. And then the second part, is second step, the A is allow or accept. And it's that, okay, so this is how, this, this is really how it is right now. And just really make space for that without, again, without judging it. So just you recognize, you allow, say, okay, this is the way it is. Yes, I allow it to be this way. The next step, the I is investigate. And this is more of a somatic inquiry than a cognitive inquiry. By investigating, it's like, where is this in the body? How do I feel this? How do I experience this? Um, and uh, Tara says sometimes her investigation is, what does this need? As you're just, what, what does what's going on right now need? And then the, the last step, which originally, when Michelle McDonald developed this, she said was non-identification. This is not I, this is not mine, this is not me, this is just what's happening. And it's been revised to be nurture. So the N is for nurture, about sort of how do I take care of this? How can I hold this with compassion and tenderness? And Tara said, actually, when you do that, when you can actually be in just holding whatever it is with a kind of uh, tenderness, kindliness, friendliness, that's really where non-identification then is kind of the, the outcome of it. Because you're not congealed uh, around it and you're trying to sort of pry yourself up. You realize, oh, this is just how it is right now. These are the changing um, sensations, mind states, and I care about them. And in that, that caring, it really um, kind of diffuses things in a way. So I'm going to, I will suggest that we do that as we do our, start with our meditation right now, and we'll do it for 10 minutes. And I will just again remind you of uh, what these steps are if you are able to do that. And, you know, of course, there is no uh, obligation if that's not what is going to be helpful to you today. So.
So we can just begin by appreciating um, the goodness of our intentions in showing up here to explore, explore the parami of wisdom, to really look at how we can develop ourselves, develop our practice, be of benefit to ourselves and all beings. And then just bring your attention to whatever is predominant in the mind or the body at this moment. Maybe do a gentle sweep in the body. And just check in and see where the mind is right now. Is there something that the mind is wanting? Something the mind's resisting? And just name whatever that is, whatever you find. And it might even be something very flat, you know, lack of affect. So whatever it is, just see if you can recognize it. And then make a space for it. Just completely accept it. This is how it is right now. And just breathe with that. And then let yourself investigate whatever this is by just seeing where do I notice this in the body? Is there a place in the body where this is manifesting as tightness or some sort of restlessness? You can even put a hand on a body part if that seems appropriate. You can put your hand on your heart. If there's a kind of achiness, a kind of tightening of the heart, sadness. And then we just bring our care to that. Recognizing that this is impermanent. This is how it is right now. But this is impermanent. And I can take care of myself by just being open to whatever's going on 
in a way that brings compassion or friendliness. And we can recognize that we're not alone in this. Other people feel this way. And knowing that other people feel this way, that what we're feeling is not alien or isolating because other people know how this feels, we can really feel connected. I'll just breathe with this for another few minutes. Just being fully present with how it is now. So um, thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, have people, um, how was that working with, with rain? Anyone have any response to that, that practice? Feel free just to unmute and jump in. I had done with um, a few other people at Common Ground um, Raindrop with Michelle McDonald. She's actually gone further with her um, with her training, and Drop is like you know the other side of that. Um, and um, so I, I was familiar, you know, with rain and also with Tara's um, way of describing it. Um, I found tonight that um, I took on something too big. And um, so at a certain point um, with the kind of nurturing part, the end part, um, I like 
felt the most nurturing thing I could do is to pull out of it. And, mm -hmm. um, and I look out, my computer is, I can look out and I see trees, skies, clouds. Um, and um, I, um, I've been trying to touch in a little bit to generational trauma and I can only go somewhere near it. And, and I'm not sure if this is a story or if it's true um, for me. Um, I don't have a lot of feelings in my body. I feel pain, but otherwise I'm pretty numb. And um, so over the, you know, maybe past year, it's like I, I'll just kind of touch up to it. And, um, and I, I noted confusion um, but it seemed the best way to take care of myself was um, to touch and then come out. Mm -hmm. That sounds really, really skillful. Uh, I learned a, a term uh, a couple of months ago I thought was very interesting that applies to what you said, Mary, and it's called resourcing. So the, I, and this is for people who do, it was doing some work with um, a white allies group around um, it's called somatic experiencing. And so it's to work with our bodily responses to being white people and in a culture in which white is dominant and oppressive. And the, the leaders, the guides talk about resourcing. So it's just what you did, uh, Mira. It's that you, uh, you, know, you look out on trees uh, you have things around you often that are um, visual, auditory, sensory um, resources so that when you start to feel overwhelmed, you can immediately tap out and um, touch some of those. Uh, so I, that's, that's a very skillful um, thing to do. And I, I, was unfamiliar with this idea of resourcing that you, um, when you're doing a difficult kind of work to have things in your immediate environment that will provide um, comfort and stability. And also that just in a very sensory way that you can direct your, um, your vision. Um, so, so thank you for, for sharing that. If the helicopters get too loud, someone can just, I don't know, can you hear the helicopters? Okay. You have a lot of helicopters these days. Um, so this week we're gonna talk about the, um, the parami of, of wisdom. And wisdom is, you know, these paramis kind of build on each other. So we need to shut the window for the, We've had some military helicopters in, in the area. So wisdom is the ability to discern and to see deeply. And in Buddhism, the idea of wisdom is that it is essentially seated in the three characteristics of existence. It's understanding impermanence, uh, um, the uh, in each of characters, it's, it's understanding dukkha, which you know we often talk about as suffering, but um, etymologically, dukkha comes from the hub of a wheel uh, not being in alignment with the axle. So etymologically, dukkha or suffering is being out of alignment or Santikaro, again, using that idea of the wheel, Santikaro talks about it as that which is hard to bear. Um, sometimes it's translated as dis-ease. So, you know, it's, it's the, the unsatisfactory uh, nature of conditioned experience. And then the other characteristic of experience, in addition to impermanence and dukkha, um, is, um, Anatta, 
and that is the not self or that, that it's not that there's no self it's that things are not self another way of looking at that is the um, impersonality of experience you know when you're out and it's it's a nice day and you're having walking and suddenly you know a storm blows up and you know it's like why me you know that that sort of tendency that we often have to center ourselves in all of our experiences why should this be happening to me now why is this that everything is always kind of about me so i like to think about um this sort of not self characteristic in um in ways as as just um so much of our experience is impersonal you know that you're there's an earthquake, there's a storm, you know, someone gets hit by a car. Um, so much experience is just, you know, you are in this place at this time and there are these causes and, and conditions. And so wisdom, and that's not to say that we're never responsible for anything, but wisdom is really rooted in this appreciation that the ground is always moving. Change is always, always happening. And a lot of our, our suffering comes from our clinging to wanting things either to not be this way or to stay the same. You know, that there's so much of our, our, um, our suffering sort of at a micro level and a macro level is about really resisting change. And I mean, and the, the big one, of course, is that we're all going to die, right? That's the really, the really hard one, that we are impermanent. And that's, that's um, a challenge. Ruth King, a uh, wonderful um, person who wrote Mindful of Race, she says all the time, everything is imperfect, impermanent, and impersonal. And that's kind of her mantra, she's imperfect, impermanent, impersonal. And uh, you know, just to keep that as, um, as a sort of uh, mantra, when we begin to look at, at wisdom, because wisdom is really going to be about the ability to discern, to choose right action, ultimately. But that understanding about choosing right action is really rooted in deeply understanding the way things are. The way things are is we are all impermanent. And we all, all suffer. And we all have things happen to us that just happen to us. And that's kind of the way the world is. Deeply, deeply impermanent. And once we can really get that and get how quickly things have, can change. You know, two weeks ago, I was mostly thinking about COVID-19 and um, you know, you know, isolation. What, what would the summer look like? What would the fall would like? Would I be on Zoom forever? Am I ever gonna be able to get my hair cut? You know, that, that was sort of where I was you know, um, a week ago. And you know, I could not have imagined at that time that I would be, you know, patrolling my alleys looking to see if people had left incendiaries. You know, and I'd walk down to common ground every day with my my heart in my throat to see if it was okay. And you know, and my my post office is gone. It is it is a shell and ashes. And you know, the restaurant I love, it's a shell and ashes. The Walgreens is gone. Yeah, it just and and I just you know, kept. I would walk to common ground, saying, "All right, you know, I, this is this is a great teaching in impermanence, and a great teaching in clinging." But so Mark kept saying over and over again, "You know, it's a building. It's not common ground. It's a building." And so you know, really rooting myself in that that sort of um, impermanence. And rooting myself in the incredible suffering 
that uh, the communities of color have experienced in you know the, the incredible um, history of systemic racism in Minneapolis and particularly the incredible um, racism in a lot of the Minneapolis police force. Um, you know, that was, that's another, another part of really rooting myself. And there's just so much suffering going on and now, and now more suffering. And not taking it personally. You know, I think about, you know, my Walgreens, my post office and, and the, you know, the jobs, the lovely people I would interact with who worked there. And I think, okay, that's gone. That's really gone. And that's really seeing how things are. So the task of, of wisdom is to really see how things are. And on that basis, we choose to act. So you can ask yourself, what do I see clearly in this situation? Even if it's just your own um, say response to watching watching the news or watching a Facebook feed or something. What do I see clearly in this situation? Because so often, I mean, it's my experience, if I'm not really paying attention, I just kind of absorb and move with it, move with my opinion. I have to have an opinion about what I just saw. I have to have a view about what I just saw instead of can I look, what do I see clearly in this situation? What do I see clearly? And not only about sort of seeing externally, but seeing internally. What do I see clearly about my own reactivity in this moment? What's my own reactivity like? What am I clinging to? So then the next question, which comes out of this is, you know, what's causing my suffering right now? And what I've noticed in my reflections this, this week have been, uh, there's a lot of, of I in what's causing the suffering. I mean, it's really easy for me to kind of, of move to, um, you know, sort of reflections about what I won't have now. That, um, you know, I won't get to talk to that nice person at the post office or the nice pharmacist at, at Walgreens. Um, you know, I won't get to go to the library. You know, I, there's, there's the, the suffering is about sort of my story about the future that I'm not going to have, as opposed to, um, you know, sort of doing something that might be um, more constructive. And it's not that I, I don't want to say that there's not a place for grief because grief is really important. So I'm not, I'm not minimizing uh, real grief and real loss. But what I am seeing in myself are when I stop to pay attention, um, there are these stories about this sort of um, future, um, you know, future that I'm not going to, uh, future pleasures that I'm not going to have. Um, and also, uh, I've been looking at what am I identified with. And I've been identified in partly with performing being a good white person, you know, wanting to be seen as a good white person, and um, that's just something to just watch that watch that tendency. But you know, to do the right thing, where do I show up? How do I show up? You know, uh, just sort of watching watching a lot of um, performative acts on Facebook in a way. And you know, some, 
some very, very skillful, but just really, really watching, trying to, to really discern what is, what is the action that will be um, beneficial to myself and beneficial to others. You know, there's a, a story they have in, in Zen circles that they say, you know, what is the, what is the, you know, what is the ultimate teaching? And the answer is appropriate response. And that's, that's really um, challenging. So throughout these, especially as I, I think, as we work with anxiety, one of the, the interesting questions I think is, what is my understanding? And is my understanding a misunderstanding? And just to go into that as a kind of, of open question, what is, what is my understanding of this situation right now? And you know, wisely choosing the right action depends on knowledge and experience and understanding. And one of the interesting books I, I read this past year that really had a, a big effect on me is a, a book by a guy named, uh, he's, he died in 2018. He's been a long time public health hero of mine, Hans Rosling. And he wrote a book called Factfulness. And I think the subtitle is, some, is why things aren't as bad as you think they might be. Um, which for many people who are really hard headed, just seems like, well, I'm not gonna read this book. But you know, one of the things that Hans Rosling said is, if you ever get a single statistic, it tells you nothing. If someone tells you that you know, four million babies um, died of uh, preventable diseases this year, that's really not a useful statistic. What you need to know are what were the statistics the year before, and five years before, and 10 years before that statistics only make sense in comparison. It's, it's a really interesting, interesting book that really uh, brought my attention to how quickly I form an opinion without all the facts. And when we talk about um, you know, wanting to choose wisely, uh, to act wisely, it's really important for us to have some really good knowledge. And sometimes it's scientific knowledge, knowing basics about biology. Um, although I, I'm laughing now because I'm remembering the New Yorker had um, a great cartoon um, about a month and a half ago. And there's a guy sitting at a computer and he's telling um, his female partner who's in there, he says, this is amazing, he said, you know, uh, three months ago, all my friends were, were constitutional experts, and now they're all experts on epidemiology. And I thought, yeah, you know, our, our quick, um, our, our, you know, having opinions about things that we don't really know. So wise action, acting with wisdom, especially in the, you know, when we try to bring our, our, um, our mindfulness into, into the world, into our action. Part of it is really, we need to have knowledge and we need to be, be careful about, about that. Um, the facts of a situation, um, you know, which might mean like, for, for example, um, here in Minneapolis, um, knowing the um, history of racism, you know, uh, knowing about redlining, um, you know, there, there's so much, there's a, a wonderful um, documentary called 13th, which is about the 13th Amendment, which is the, you know, history of, um, you know, the uh, carceral state, our incarceration. The book, The New Jim Crow, which was just a book that was just tremendously painful to read. And a lot of it is about policing and, um, 
and the legal system. And those are books that just really, the new Jim Crow particularly, just was like a scouring. It was so, it was really hard to read. And I think if I had not been in a book group at Common Ground that was reading it, or I had an assignment, I just probably would have put it down and maybe not finished it because it was so hard. So I think, you know, when we look at something like, like this, uh, what's going on right now, it is really important to have some um, understanding, uh, some real knowledge. And then we need to have experience. And sometimes it's our own experience. We bring that to, um, to the table. But sometimes our own experience isn't enough, which is why it's really important for us to listen deeply to, to other people and their experience, people who don't come from the same frameworks that we come, come from. And um, you know, that, that looking at, so knowledge and experience. And um, I really found as I get older, um, I, I trust my own um, intimations that something isn't right that I, I've, I've gotten to trust my own um, hesitancy um, a lot more. And I think that's really kept me from sort of, of blundering on about things. So I think this just, doesn't, this just doesn't seem right. And so I think that, that we really need to trust our experience. And um, finally, uh, understanding, our own understanding what we want to, and it's, um, you know, in there are the um, five daily reflections uh, that I think are are really uh, helpful to me. That every day I say to myself, "I'm growing old. Um, illness and infirmity await me. My death approaches daily. All that is dear and delightful to me will be separated from me." and that I am the inheritor of my past karma, the owner of my present karma, and the fabricator of my future karma. And the reason that's so helpful uh, is to really take responsibility for what I'm doing. And I'll also say as, as a parent, you know, I can say every day, illness and infirmity await me. And then something goes wrong, and you know I'm just sort of gobsmacked. But I'm such a healthy person. How could I get sick? So I don't want to say that this is sort of uh, there's anything magical about it, or that I'm uh, the perfect exemplar of this. But it's really helpful just to remind myself every day that you know my death approaches daily, and that really does help us make wiser choices. That really does help us um, get to the heart of this. That when we think that our, our, when we're reminded of our own mortality, we don't take things, take important things so lightly. We really step up to uh, the need to be discerning and to act when it is appropriate. And that really is all about this wise discernment. Wisdom is this investigative ability that we have. It is, it is a virtue of investigation. And it's one that we really, really um, need now when it is uh, a time when we are just inundated by views and opinions. And so it, it's a, a wonderful um, practice. So I'm gonna leave it at that um, for now and hear what you have to say about <coughs> the way you've worked with um, wisdom or making choices or what you are thinking about or what's really uh, challenging about this. So just unmute yourself and join in.
uh, <clears throat> like everyone, uh, I'm sure, uh, when all this started last week, uh, for me, I, I, I was just observing my, my state of being, my emotions. Uh, I found myself getting so worked up and, um, and, and, and going, oh my God, uh, I'm not practicing what compassion is about because I was beyond empathetic every time I, I, I mean, aside from the fact that George was killed, um, which is horrific in itself. Um, and historically, I've, I have experienced heavy duty racism and, um, and ma major violence and demonstrations back when I was 16 years old growing up in Cleveland, Ohio. And my dad was a cop at that time, but that's a whole other story. I'm just gonna focus on this week because I had a, an entire other story of what played out for me as a 16 year old back then. Um, so that in itself was so painful uh, to, to witness George being killed and murdered. And then the past week, every time I would hear about a, another small business or even large business being burned down, it was just, I, I was just like, oh my God, this is so much. Um, and asking Cindy, my partner, how can I, she, she would say, you know, you can't, you can't, you're circling the drain. So a couple of days ago, I, I got Sharon Salzberg's Loving Kindness book and I thought, okay, I just need a really basics with this compassion practice, this Brahma Vihara, because I had been doing metta. And, um, and Sharon says, you know, what you do in a very difficult, with a difficult situation, a group of people is with compassion, you first give compassion to the most horrific situation. And then you can move through, like in Meta, where you first do it to mm -hmm. yourself, you know, and, and so, so, so forth. And um, that helped me out tremendously. That and, and not, not uh, glued to uh, the news to see, okay, what other, is there another business that burned down or whatever? Um, so I took her words to bed with me at night. And what came up for me was sending compassion practice, really focusing in on those people that were doing, creating that violence and burning businesses down and just sending, sending them compassion saying, may you, may you not see, I'm finding myself as I go into this, you know, how, uh, may you be at peace. May you be free from suffering. May you be, be at peace. May you be free from suffering. This went on for a long time before I could even get to myself. I, I found the last several days just, just doing that practice. Um, because I found that the other way was not a form of really compassion. It was just coming from a place of many other emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so that helped me not be, to not be circling the emotional drain. That and being with nature. Like today, I just took my bicycle and I just rode and rode and rode. And anytime I would think of any kind of potential violence, would just, may they be, may, may these people be at peace. May they not have suffering. And that's all I could do. I, I, I you know, I hardly could get through any of the other steps with a compassion piece. And, and Sharon says with compassion to keep it very simple, the, the phrases, maybe one, maybe two, two phrases. Um, so that helped. So that's, 
that's what I did. That's really, really wise. Yeah, this, um, I've been struggling with wisdom. Like this morning, I got caught up, called out right off the bat, where I had been on the phone with a friend of mine that lives just uh, a couple blocks from uh, Ground Zero, where they have the memorial. And she was telling me how she you know, got up every morning at 6 and went down to the memorial and cleaned up everything. and. Uh, they would deliver the donuts and, uh, you know, Kevin, you have to come down here and see it. And, um, and, um, and then I talked to a kind of my meditation mentor at Common Ground called me a little bit later. And, um, I was telling them, you know, yeah, they say that, you know, I heard, you know, from several people, the protesters are peaceful, you know, who are these guys? And, you know, kind of rambled around a little bit. And he said, Kevin, you don't know any of that. I mean, you're just hearing secondhand knowledge. You know, you're, you know, you're hearing what you want to hear. Um, you're hearing what other people are telling you, but you haven't seen this. You, you know, you haven't. Uh, um, so it just kind of, um, you know, caught me right, you know, it's like I got caught right there that, yeah, I just kind of jumped to some conclusions. And um, and kind of at common ground is important to me, and it's mostly the practice. Um, you know, I'm a white uh, boy from the suburbs. Um, you know, I was born and raised around white people. When they taught race relations in high school, they had to bring a couple people in from a different city, you know, black people, to talk about what it was like to be a black person in the city. And um, so when I go to Common Ground, there's, you know, a lot of talk about the Dharma and there's a lot of talk about, you know, this other issue, which I know you can't separate it from, you know, the issue of racism, you know, that, that comes up there. But it's just, you know, the firsthand knowledge, you know, I don't have you know, I've been living in uh, neighborhoods, you know, racially mixed neighborhoods. And I know when I see a black person on the street, you know, my first inclination is always just, you know, to be friendly, like, you know, you're with everybody to smile and say hi and you know, give a, just a standard greeting. But I know that if the person is, you know, somebody white, like I understand, you know, I can pretty much read their face and see if they're angry and, um, you know, what kind of a mood they're in, are they gonna, are they a threat to me? Um, you know, are they drunk, are they on drugs, you know? And with people of a different race, you know, I, I can't recognize their, it takes me a while to process, you know, their, their body language. And um, so I know there's, you know, some, um, you know, I, I can't understand their experience and, and there's a little bit of lag there that I'm not, not comfortable. So um, anyway, I was just amazed, you know, how far, how fast, how quickly I was able to forget that what I've been trying to learn and you know, jump off to a conclusion because it's a friend of mine's information that a friend of mine gave me you know, that it's from a certain point of view. And I have friends, you know, that are Trump supporters too. Well, they used to be friends. I'm <laughs> not nearly as tolerant as them as I used to be, you know, relatives that you can't do anything with. So. Well, thanks. One of the things I, I mentioned, I think I've mentioned with this group that my, um, one of the things I was going to practice with this year was this idea of making space for not knowing that, uh, and it wasn't just like allowing that, no, it was like really making space for not knowing. So I, I've been holding these two kinds of, of ideas. One is making space for not knowing. And as I've heard all of these reports about who's doing what and what's happening. And, and, I, and, I, said, and, and I don't really know that. I don't know if anyone really knows that. But then there's also, on the other hand, this responsibility to be as, as informed as we can be in efforts where it's, it's important. 
So, um, you know, I, I think that that's sort of what, what you're suggesting is this honest admission of, of not knowing. And then the next step is to figure out, well, how to, how to know more. And when you, you talked about reading body language and faces, actually, there's been some new data that's come out that, you know, people used to think that there were the same expressions for fear, anger, disgust, and they were just, you know, universal. And there was actually some social science done more recently that says, actually, that's not the case, that the older studies were really flawed. And that, you know, uh, in, um, you know, Papua New Guinea, uh, when they see pictures of, you know, people showing disgust or anger, they read those very differently. So our, I, I mean, one issue, sort of a larger issue of why sometimes it may be difficult uh, across various cultures, and they're talking mostly internationally, for people to really understand each other is that people do have different cultural uh, facial expressions and body expression, and especially around issues of fear, anger, and, and disgust, which are sometimes harder to uh, tease out. So that's not, um, you know, we, we always thought that these were sort of universal and transparent. But more recent data suggests that, that they're not. Um, but I think your, your other point is just, you know, coming from one sort of limited milieu, um, you know, what you can do then to um, really educate yourself and to, to learn more, um, to really support your understanding would be a really good thing. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And, and I, it is really important for us to say, do, do I really know that? You know, that, 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 that first question I asked, you know, am I seeing, what am I seeing clearly? What am I seeing clearly? Who else would like to contribute something? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my heart's with all of you. First, I wanted to be in Minneapolis to be safe because I'm in Boston. And then everything shifted. And now I just want to be in Minneapolis to be with you. Well, you're here with us tonight. Every day, I speak to somebody. And um, you know, I don't know if you've had the experience of haven't talked to family in a while or something and some relative dies and somebody forgot to tell you and then in passing they just mention, you know, so almost every day I talk to somebody and in passing they mention, like Hamsa was saying, another place that's no longer. And it's, it's, it's like a, I've lost it. I, oh, this the loss. And um, when I left in March, I never, in a million years, how would I ever have thought that um, the Minneapolis I left would not be there the way I left it when I came back next time. And I've been thinking of this in terms of people and permanence, that when I engage in conversation with people, sometimes, you know, the it's hard, to, that's a challenging area of Dharma for me, of staying mindful in dialogue or in relation with someone else. I know a lot of people say that. And, I lose my mindfulness or I get lost. And sometimes I say goodbye and I, I'm not even aware what's going on when I'm saying goodbye. I've, I've been thinking about that. Can I be present and look at the person like with impermanence in mind at the beginning, during, and at the end? Am I taking that person like right now? Am I taking the, you all in with the notion of, yeah, uh, maybe this is the last time. And it's not a morbid reflection, the way that reflections, you know, they're not intended to be morbid, but they do wake me up, you know, like, uh, so I was thinking that you gave last night uh, in the other group, Patrice, about the teaching to Rahula about action, mm -hmm. you know, reflecting before, during, and afterward. And I'm thinking of that with interacting with, with people. And then what you just said about um, the different, Cultural, uh, you know, I used to work in the public schools in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and then in Boston and uh, as a mental health provider, not as a school personnel. 
and the teachers are predominantly here in Boston, predominantly white, and the, the children were predominantly African American, mostly black. And um, one of the things that would happen over and over was like issues around disrespect and authority. And young boys in particular who had been trained to, to avert gaze when a person of authority was addressing them. So they looked down. And uh, so many times I would walk by and the, there would be a, a big white teacher and this is elementary school and a small black child and the child would be, you could see respectful in their mind, looking away, looking down. And the teacher would be, look at me when I talk to you. Look me in the eye when I talk to you. How disrespect, you know, and, and, you, and the, the heartbreak of seeing that, you know, karmic collision right there. Just, mm -hmm. you know, that was many years ago. Hopefully some of that's changed, but I envision in some of these situations, we're talking about, you know, spontaneous reading people's cues and attributions. Like you said, what am I seeing before me versus what am I adding to that? Like, what mm -hmm. am I projecting in terms of my own understanding? So uh, I, lately, I don't think I'm seeing anything clearly. I'm just like, I'm just feeling there's just a lot of not clear. That's, that's what's before me. And that's a good thing to recognize. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really, that's really, that's, that's mindfulness, recognizing when you, when you, when you are not clear, things I are not clear and, and being, uh, you know, allowing that, be, being okay with that, not, not rushing to some sort of um, resolution. Uh, you know, that idea of having to, having to get, you know, having to know what, what is the right thing. Years ago, I knew someone who was a social worker who said, um, you know, that whenever she had to make a decision, she would just mull it over, and she said, you know, eventually she would get to make a decision, but she took forever. And she said, I'm just waiting for things to get clear. And, uh, and was very skillful in making decisions. But, you know, I, I know my own personality is, is much more about, you know, let's get this done. You know, I'm on a timeline, let's get this done. And, and having the patience to uh, sit with things being unclear, which is why I talked about sort of making space for not knowing. I thought that was a really <coughs> good corrective for me um, mm -hmm. this year to sit with that. So uh, our time is up. Does anyone want to say anything before we um, close out? I really appreciate everyone being here tonight and um, just feel the importance of us coming together to talk about um, you know developing these qualities of the heart that you know help us to live with um, with integrity and and qualities of the heart so that we don't harm ourselves and that we don't harm others so really taking the um, the nobility of that aspiration to uh, the heart. It is a noble aspiration to practice um, developing these, these qualities of all qualities of non-harming. So thank you all, and I hope to see you next week. Take care.